the stuff that I get for free. <laughs> That's perfect. So um, he <laughs> called it the boarding house. So one of the first times I ever met Matt by Alice, and this is really funny, he, because um, Ali Baba grew up in San Clemente, and he knew Matt from back then, back when he was just doing mayhem as like a backyard yeah. board thing. We ended up painting the side of the boarding house, he and I, for like a case of beer. <laughs> That's the first time I ever met Matt by Alice. <laughs> Matt was amazing. And then many other stories after that, too, like Sublime days that we met and all that stuff. That's why I actually met Sublime. Wow. Because w- we did an interview with Sublime for the magazine. And I went and just, because I, mean, I was a big fan then. It was yeah. just a backyard band. They, they just did parties, basically. Yeah, you know? they played backyards for beer. Yeah. And then they were sponsored by Black Flies, and they were part of the industry, and they'd be at every party, and they'd be at ASR, and you'd just run into them all the time. And then they play frat parties at USC, so I'd see them there. And then I just became friendly with those guys. So that must have been, what a fucking cool time period in it some ways, crazy. you know? Like, like California in the 90s, like a whole punk rock scene too, with like Offspring and even Blink was in the early, yeah, Blink yeah. was there, No Doubt, like all these places. Green now. Day. Green Day. Y- yeah. Green Day was more NorCal, but it's like in the SoCal kind of punk rock scene. Yeah. And it was like Pennywise. Adolescence. And like that whole crew. Yeah, Adolescence, TSOL. You know, yeah, like TSOL. Oh. Yeah, it was like all those bands. Johnny Monster. Johnny Monster and the Jordan Air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, that that must have been pretty, w- I mean, that in like Black Flies was pretty wild uh, yeah. company. Did you work for them? I or? did not work for them. They were advertisers in Beach Happy, and we were very close um, because they were literally down the street from, from, from Beach Happy. So yeah. we knew all those dudes. So how long did you stay, spend out there then? College, and then a little bit after. And then you came back here. What... What did you end up doing? I came back here. I had a friend. I was thought I'd be in the magazine world. Um, I had a friend, Matt Hanna, who worked for Spin. He was Bob Guccione Jr.'s, um, cool. yeah. was Bob Guccione Jr.'s um, assistant. Yeah. And he got me in just as an internship with Spin. <sighs> and I was working in the photo department for them just as an intern. Yeah, it was This fun. is like mid-90s now? Yeah. Like 95? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How... That's like their peak power. It was, yeah, it was like them and Rolling Stone. You know, there yeah. was no real, there was no other kids on the block. Well, you know, then Ray Gun kind you know. All Ray Gun came time. along, yeah. Paper, you know. Paper, well, yeah, Paper was, Paper was more of a cultural magazine. Yeah. Actually, I just saw David Hershowitz the other night. We had a great powwow with Steve Olson. Wow. Shout out Steve Olson, my, my AKA dad. <laughs> so, not really, but everyone thinks he is because we look alike. But <laughs> <laughs> and we're cranky. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I started working for, for them. Um, the publisher at the time caught wind and knew that I knew the guys from Sublime. Mm-hmm. And at that time, they were sponsoring this thing called the Warp Tour. Yes. And they were one of the first sponsors. So they're like, "That's it. You know those guys. You're going out. You're going to be our editor at large. You're going to be on tour with them." We have Simple Shoes as one yeah. of the sponsors. You can go out with those guys. You have an RV, the whole kit. And I went out on the, I went out on the road. I was a editor at large for Spin Magazine. How? Spin all, right, all right. What? What stories? Come on, give them up. Oh, give them up. No, give them up. No, man, I go to. <laughs> I can't say I'll go to jail because I went to jail on that tour. Oh, okay. Do you want to disclose how that happened? Uh, just don't drink and. Florida. Just don't drink in Florida. <laughs> Aren't those two synonymous, though? Like not really. Not when, you, not when you're in the back of a tri- pickup truck with the drummer from Sublime. <laughs> so we we were on tour. Um, you know, you're dirty. You haven't showered forever. You're like just kind of piecing it all together. Yeah. You're young. You don't care. We were drunk. Half almost time famous anyway. in it. Almost. Pretty much. Pretty much. So I, the guys from Sublime knew because Miguel the producer of Sublime lived in Florida, grew up in Florida. Right. He's like, go meet so-and-so, this girl. She's got, she's like either her parents have a lake house or something. So we went there, we showered, we did the whole kit. She was driving us back to the venue and we were in the back of a pickup truck facing backwards, facing out. Yeah. Bud was on one side, I was on the other. We had beers. Oh. We pull into the venue and we're like drinking beers and a bicycle cop sees us. <laughs> and he's like, 
you guys, stop drinking. And we're like, keep going. And we start slapping on the, on the cabin. <laughs> she stops. <laughs> we got pulled over by a bike cop. <laughs> so <laughs> he hops out one side over the, over the wall of the back bed. I hop out on the other side yeah. of the wall of the back bed. Next thing you know, we're pinned up against the wall of the truck. And they're saying, stop resisting. They're yelling at us. And we're like, what are you guys talking about? So they, like, threw the book at us. We went to, like, we went to jail for the night. It was a disaster. We had a Rochambeau to see who, who got the top bunk, though. That was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was kind of put a wrinkle on the thing. I mean, uh, basically, Bud missed, uh, he missed a date in Miami because we got arrested in Fort Lauderdale. Gosh, that must have made some good content, though, for Spin. <laughs> um, no, this is pre, pre cell phones, pre everything. I had to be kind of about it. Oh, no, I man. didn't write about it. No, I didn't write about Are you kidding me? I had to write just, you know, about the show. And you, you went out and it was like, they had a drop, they would drop ship magazines to me because yeah. I had a booth. And they drop ship magazines to like the different venues. So if the magazines didn't show up, I had to get on a, on a telephone, like pay phone, yeah. at the venue, call spin and be like hey where are the magazines and like about that they're at the last place you were i'm oh, like okay shit. great so what am i doing today and i just cruise around take photos and get drunk with some wine that's amazing <laughs> not every day but it was like we had a lot of weed and we tried to figure out fun things to do in a booth with no magazines or like a few magazines so bob DeGianni jr at the time was a big proponent for um against aids yeah so we had condoms we had tons of condoms. So you did a lot of uh, balloon, uh, like kind of uh, <laughs> animal balloons no, with I, them? I would, <laughs> so I got the bright idea to recruit like different people from bands to bring them in and kind of just give some sort of like presence for spin yeah. at these events. So I had Bud from Sublime one day and he starts winging condoms at kids and he's like, free gum, <laughs> free gum. <laughs> <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> the surprise in their face. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Poor little fourteen-year-old girl getting pegged in the head with a condom. <laughs> yeah. You should have been arrested, no matter what. Anyway, <laughs> it came. Karma came to get us. But God, like that must have been pretty wild then. And then, so then, what happened after spin? Then, like, did you, did you continue? Where, what, what kind of direction were you thinking after that? Um, were you like, I don't know if I want to do this? <laughs> yeah, I bounced around a little bit, you know, odd jobs and whatnot. And then I ended up at the time, um, I ended up at New Line Cinema. <clears throat> and this is when the infancy, the beginnings of like dot com era, yeah. like the 90s boom, you know. So this is when AOL was big. Yeah. When AOL had this um, this front page, when you signed on at AOL, they had a loading page, and it was it was uh, you could push each button, and each button had a direction, mm -hmm. kind of like what Google would be. Instead of like putting in Google, yeah. like I want to go to this website, you just go in, and it'd be an open page full of buttons, and you push on a button like sports, yeah, music, whatever. And I became a part of this thing called the Hub, and the Hub was kind of like beach happy, but in digital form. Yeah, and I became like. Um, I was the roaming editor. I was Pat the Rat for um, a moniker that still haunts me to this day. <laughs> but I, I love it fondly because when I was a little kid, I was a water rat. Yeah. And they called me Pat the Rat because I was never out of the water. So that's where the rat came from. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I ended up doing, like, all kinds of things with, like, I did back to Matt Bialis. I did like, you know, digital content for the hub by like interviewing Matt Bialis or interviewing like Chris Ward, a, a writer for them at the time and doing like board short reviews or going to free Tibet concert and like covering that. Cause it was like everything it was smattering under mm -hmm. one button so I could do a multitude of things. It, it felt like the late nineties was such a great time to be in New York city. Yeah, it was fun. I really, I have fond memories of being in New York City and there was like a sense of kind of optimism, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but well, freedom. Like again, it, was the, it was like kind of the dot-com thing. Everybody was throwing money at things. Totally. There were parties. There was like 
the vision of the next, the future. Yeah, and like you had downtown, Soho wasn't fully overwhelmed yet. Like it was, you could still get an apartment down there. I remember going to some amazing loft parties and you know, you had raves, you had, I mean, Brooklyn was just mm -hmm. totally, you know, I mean, Williamsburg was... Williamsburg wasn't Williamsburg it was today. No, yeah. it was fucking rad. Like, mm -hmm. just warehouse parties yeah. all the time. Like, it just, it felt like there was a lot to discover, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, like, even the Lower East Side, there was tons yeah. of bands and there was, like, bars and... Kim's like, video. Kim's video. <laughs> like save the robots talking about like fun bars that are gone uh or clubs that are gone um but yeah there was like there were so many bar venues down yeah. on avenue a at the time like brownies and then there was like uh continental and then there was well cbgb's obviously and yeah. it was just there was all these clubs that had venues and no one it wasn't like you had to have a venue you had to have a license to yeah. be, you know a cabaret license it was just no holds barred. You're like, cool, there's a band tonight. It or so-and-so's cool. playing here. And then you'd go there, and they'd be like, oh, so-and-so's playing over here. Let's go check them out. It was fun. It was great. And, and, then, and then you started Epstein's. And then I started Epstein's. How did that come about? The beginning of the end. No, the beginning of the end? <laughs> no, I make the joke now. It's like, it's one of those things I wanted to do before I died, and it nearly killed me. <laughs> Why? It's just the bars are tough, man. Bars are like long hours, and you're always coming up with things to get people in the door. And you know, it's once until it gets traction and gains momentum, it's a haul. It's hard to kind of get things off the ground. Yeah, yeah, it is. So I struggled for a couple of years with that, and then it just kind of caught on, and then it became, you know, a skate hangout. Yeah. And then like, you know. And through my surf industry connections, anybody who would come through New York would stop in and go there. And Do a screening or an event, or you know? Screenings and have all kinds of stuff, yeah. yeah. Or after parties for did, a multitude of bands. Did you work for Quicksilver for a bit, too? I did, because that, at that time, because of my ag advertising background at Beach Happy, I knew all these different brands, Quicksilver and Volcom, you know, and... and Vans even. So when they came, they started opening up um, retail stores in New York. Like I remember. It became, uh, you know, they, I don't want to say like they found New York as far as like a surf destination, but like surfing became more than just surfing. It became like a cool thing. You know, yeah. Like wearing clothes to be emulated surfer because that was what's cool. So there was a Times Square store for for Quicksilver. The Soho, Soho store, store for Quicksilver. Okay. There was a Fifth Avenue well, store. The Soho for Quicksilver. store was the first one, right? Yeah, I, I worked at that one actually. Yeah. You and like Mark Temme, basically. Oh. <laughs> so um, I did work there, yeah, in the beginning. But I went in there because you notice I glazed over that one. So. Um, <laughs> I went in there because at the time Steve Jones um, was the, the the art director for all the stores, yeah. along with Peter Schroff. Oh my gosh! Maniac. So um, I love Schroff. Shout out Schroff. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I would do all the interiors. They had vibe boxes that Schroff did, and just kind of all the retail environment they would design. And um, like I said, I was like the satellite person that they kind of trusted me because I knew all these guys face to mm -hmm. face and they could just call me and they could just be like, go, this is what we need to do, make it happen. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what happened. That's why I started doing like windows in Times Square for Quicksilver <sighs> and stuff. Uh, and then they did the DC store and then, you know, friends bounce around among, among surf brands. Then my friends at Volcom, and I knew those guys. And that's when all of this vinyl stuff started because I started doing all the windows and tearing down the vinyl. Um, sorry, this is before Epstein. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was, at the time, I, I went back. I've been in and out of the art, like an art career. And I was working for Tom Sachs at the time. So I, I know, this is crazy. So I was working for Tom at the time and this guy, Tolan Grinnell. And Tolan Grinnell is amazing. He did these like steamer cases. Um, that opened up and became these worlds. So I had these two great um, art mentors. Um, and I was also like keeping my foot in the surf world by like doing windows for Quicksilver. Yeah. And, like, 
they would pay me and I could get board shorts and wetsuits <laughs> and all that stuff. You know, all the things yeah, you want. Yeah, of know. course. Um, so that's, that's what kept that going. And then after a while, I was like, all right, I'm just juggling.